My partner is Anthony Kosha, and we're interviewing Donald H. Turk, and it is April 30th, 2004, at RFA. Uh, What's your full name? Donald Harrison Turk. Where and when were you born? I was born in Williamson, New York, uh, August 20th, 1922. What was your pre-service education? Well, I went to Camden, I went to elementary school, and just a one, one room school, and then I went to Camden to high school, and then I went to Morrisville and graduated from Morrisville. Okay. Um, did you have any pre-service employment? Yes. What was it? I, I worked in a cannon factory and also in a feed mill part time. When and how did you enter the service? Well, I was going to be drafted, and uh, I was my senior year at Morrisville. It was only a two-year school, and then I found out if I enlisted in the reserve, I would be able to finish my school year and then go in the service. So I enlisted in the reserves in December of um, 1942. And uh, when you first heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor, what was your reaction? Well. Probably some anger mm -hmm. and uh, a wonderment. Was I going to be going into the service or what would happen? Mm -hmm. And did you know Mrs. Turk before you left? Yes, we were engaged to be married before I left for to go over. And I, I knew her uh, when we were in college, that's where we met. So we were both in the same college. She was a year ahead of me. Oh. So, uh, and did you guys get engaged before you left, or? Before I went overseas, not before, uh, after I was in, and came home on a furrow, and then we became engaged then. Mm -hmm. Did any of your friends enlist with you? Yes, there were two other uh, students from more, so we enlisted together. Oh. And uh, how did you break the news to your family and friends? Well, I. My parents didn't have a telephone or anything. Mm -hmm. So I, I probably uh, um, talked with them, went home a weekend maybe, and talked with them that I was going to enlist in the reserve so that I'd be able to finish my year in school. And how did they react to that? Well, I don't remember a lot of, about that. That well, was a long time ago. <laughs> Okay, and what branch of service did you decide to serve and why? I, when I enlisted, I enlisted in the engineers. Oh. And then because I went to Morrisville and, and uh, from some of the testing that they did before, um, I felt that would be a good area for me to go into. So I enlisted in the reserve, and the reserves and engineer, engineers. Mm -hmm. What was your major at Morrisville? Agriculture. Uh -huh. um, where and when did you did you go for uh, basic training? Well, I, when I first enlisted, uh, I, I went in May after I graduated from Morrisville. I went to Fort Niagara. It mm -hmm. was an pre it was an induction center. I left Rome Railroad Station down there. Okay. My parents brought me there, and I remember that time real well. Mm -hmm. And um, then went. To Fort Niagara and was there about um, a month or so, and then they closed that and moved us all to Camp Upton down on Long Island. On Long Island. And then um, while I was there, um, I would get, I usually look for your name on the list to ship out to wherever you were going to go for basic training. And uh, I went in the hospital with pneumonia the day that my name came out on the list with the other two buddies I had to go into the engineers, and so I didn't go then, and about uh, three weeks later, I went to Camp Fanning, Texas, mm -hmm. and that was a branch of material replacement training center when I went there. But after I'd been a little while, I took a test to um, get into the Air Force, and while I was taking that test, uh, the captain that was giving the test um, got a phone call, and the phone call was that there was no more transfers from the ground forces to the Air Force. So I ended up finishing my basic training of 16 weeks there, and then um, um, 
and it, it was then infantry replacement training. So that's how I got in the infantry. Hmm. Were you mad that you missed out on uh, the engineer part? I don't know that I was mad, but I was disappointed because I wanted to go with my buddies, which I never, so I was always with new men then. Yeah. Um, let's see. Can you recall any interesting experiences during your basic training? Well, the area in which we took our basic training was in Camp Fanning, Texas. It's near Tyler, and that's the rose capital of the world. And I remember for part of our basic training was creeping and crawling, learning to crawl and creep under fire and they had machine guns firing over the top of you while you crawl and this and it was a rose field. So we were crawling through these rose bushes as um, first part of our basic training. Oh. And then we went on some real long hikes, uh, force marches that were pretty strenuous. For, yeah. And one day we were just pitching tents and in Texas it's very hot. And one day it was 125 degrees in the shade mm -hmm. And a lot of the people passed right out on the field. And Did you? No, I didn't. No. <laughs> you kept that. Um, so you trained, what did you train for specifically in basic training? Oh, right. Well, right. We did, we do all those small arms, firing, mortars, machine guns, uh, BAR, Brown automatic rifle. Okay. And uh, were you satisfied with your basic training? Yes. You thought it was sufficient enough? Yeah, I, I believe it was. We had hand to hand out with hand to hand combat training with fixed bayonets on dummies and mm -hmm. this kind of thing. As close as you can get, right? Yeah. Um, and you were there for 16 weeks, you said? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what unit were you assigned to? Uh, there? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what I remember the unit there that I was assigned to. It was just a basic training unit C company. I can remember that, but I don't remember the you know, about it. Okay. And how were your officers? They were good. They were? Yeah. You know, I think they were fair. And they were disciplined and they trained you hard because you needed that. And do you know when you left for Europe? I left in January of 1944. Yeah, January of 1944. And when I was on the ship, the Ile de France, a troop ship. Huh. And uh, once you got there, um, what did you do for entertainment there? Do you have any like memories of entertainment? Or? Well, I remember we could go to and uh, we were in a little village, and we could go to a, a movie. They have movies once in a while. We go to those. Uh, I like to play ping pong. I played a, played a lot of ping pong. That's fun. And uh, do you remember how the food was? Was it good or bad? It was, I would say it was fairly good, I, for, I thought. Huh. Except when we would be on forced marches and be on rations. So how did you cope with shortages, shortages in rationing? Do you? Well, uh, I, I didn't come from a family where we had a lot of this world's things, so mm -hmm. it, for me it wasn't that bad, really. You so know, you're used to it already? Yeah, I was used to not having a lot to eat. You know, not, I had plenty to eat, but not a lot of to eat because I, I was very, in those days I weighed 145 pounds. Mm -hmm. Um. What was your most memorable experience out of all the war? Do you, do you know? Probably the uh, first people you see die. And I read that you were in D-Day, and what were your feelings about it? Being I'm afraid, yeah, but, you know, you didn't have a lot of time to 
analyze your feelings. You just were trained to do certain things and you went and did those. We were told to, we were on a, first day of June we got on a, a, a troop ship and when we got it, we went through the British, I don't know if you want this or not, through the English Canal, or Channel, when we went through there, there was these big bar barrage balloons on both sides and they were fastened to a boat and these balloons were up in the air, maybe two or three hundred feet, just floating there and that was to protect us from uh, enemy aircraft coming down in to strafe us or anything like that. And uh, then when we got closer to shore, we got on what they call land landing craft infantry. We had to go down these rope nets to get down into them with our packs on and everything and get into that. And then we uh, had to, were headed for shore and they told us when we hit the shore just to run. And we'd meet Father of him, so we did. Um, and you went in on June 7th? Right? Well, it was the night of the June 6th. It started in the morning, but I didn't go until the night afterward. And uh, I've read a lot about the June 6th wave, the first wave, and how, I don't know how many men died, like 95% or something like that? And uh, do you think you would have made it through if you were the first wave? No. No? And uh, when you first heard, like when you first ran up, what were your emotions like? Were you just like nervous or were you just like, like did you have adrenaline pumped through you or how, like were you more scared or more like excited? More scared, I think. Yeah. Because it was something totally new and, and uh, before we, yeah, I'm not sure we could see them uh, with um, flamethrowers um, on the, because there was big bluffs and they were had they had these um, in these caves in them where there were machine guns and they were uh, the people that were ahead of us were already uh, putting flamethrowers into those to get those spread down. And we were told that we were not to take any um, uh, prisoners at first. Why is that? Because uh, if you took a lot of prisoners, you would take so many men to take care of them and protect everybody else from them. You just couldn't do that. It's too much to handle? Like oh, it's just, it's not good war tactics. Huh. You have to have your men to be able to fight, not to protect and guard somebody. You had better things to be concerned about than having well, that's people what, to take care of. That's what they told us, you know. Hmm. Okay, and uh, I read that you sustained injuries on June 13th. Yeah. Um, and what happened? Well, uh, I, we had drunk a um, uh, a slit trench, you probably know what that is, but that's a, a narrow, uh, about two foot wide and long enough for you to lay down in. And it's about maybe a foot and a half deep. We dug those that afternoon by hedgerow because uh, we didn't have any tanks to protect us from. And they had expected we were going to get a tank attack, that's what we were told. So we were, uh, we had done these and I was laying down in one on my stomach and I had my gas mask on my chest and I had just gotten up to look over the hedgerow to see if there was any enemies coming through the field because there was um, um, flares and, and uh, shells going off around us and I laid back down and, and I don't know just what happened at all. I always felt like whatever hit me hit me, hit on my gas mask and exploded, but I'm sure that didn't happen, but I don't know what happened. But I, um, I, I realized I was hit in my arm and I thought my arm was gone. And mm -hmm. I put my hand down and I could feel my fingers on my, that hand, so, and I just carried that my left arm in my hand. And uh, there was another fellow, I don't know how I got up with him, and he said he knew where Oh, I went to um, um, Colony Aid Station first, and there were so many men in there, 
and worse than I were than I thought I were. And um, then uh, I stayed there for a while, and this fellow came, and he said he, he was from my company. He knew where the regimental aid station was, and so uh, he would take me there. And so I could walk, and I walked, and we walked, and finally I said to him, I can't go any farther. i got to go back. So I went back to the aid station and laid in the, on the dirt there until they got a chance to take care of me. And then it was getting towards morning then, and I, uh, um, they had a jeep come, and they had uh, a chaplain help me get on, up onto the jeep so I could go back to regimental aid station. And uh, I remember sitting down on a, in a doorway, it was a barn, sitting down in the doorway, and uh, and then the nice thing I remember, I was in a tent, uh, having been already operated on, and uh, was good. they were giving me blood. Mm -hmm. So you had to wait the entire night before you got any medical attention? No, I, I, the, they put, they gave me uh, some shots and um, did up my arm, and uh, packed it, you know, because it was, uh, I packed it there. So I, I had some there that night, probably by one o'clock, they had mm -hmm. done that, and they put it in a sling, my arm in a sling. But uh, they didn't, uh, you know, operate to fix it in a bone or anything like that. So you had to wait for that part, right? Well, then, uh, from this, um, when I got back to this um, um, regimental head, um, medical headquarters, then they operated it and they put it, um, my arm in a cast. And so uh, when I woke up, I had a body cast on from my waist up to my neck, and this arm was in a body cast. And they had put some kind of a, uh, like a, um, traction device that they had for the, in those days, uh, where it would pin went through my thumb, and there was a thing out here you could turn it that, and another one in my elbow, I went out that way. And uh, so then, uh, that was what I... Was so was your arm like just broken in yeah, a was, lot of places? Or? Uh, it was broken and uh, all tore up in here, and broke up here. So that's why they put them on, I guess. And then they they went uh, from there. I went to a, a tent hospital right on the coast of France. Mm -hmm. And uh, where I was injured was about um, a few miles before we got to St. Lo. But anyway, they uh, um, I went to this hospital in France, and I was one of the first ones in this hospital. So. The nurses were so great to us. They we got back bumps about three or four times a day because we didn't have a lot of fellows. In. No, not in the tent hospital. This was in England, but in the tent hospital on the coast, we just were in a hospital. And I don't really remember a lot about it because I, I think that I lost so much blood that I really wasn't much with it, you know, because they kept giving me blood. And uh, then finally they flew. I flew my airplane from. France back to about 60 miles from London to a hospital. And in that hospital we, where they were the first ones in, and we had uh, a real great care. In fact, the, the first letter that I wrote, I couldn't write my, uh, so I had a nurse wrote a letter to my mother for me. I told her what to write, and she did. Um. And I read that you got some burns on your face. Was that from like the explosion or uh, phosphorus? Phosphorus. Um, they, they, I had burns on my eye here and on my face, but I had a um, kerchief and I had a little bit of water left 
And we didn't have, we were told not to bring any of the water there because they were afraid that Germans might poison it, you know, if we to get rid of us that way. And so we just had, and we didn't have any, I don't remember getting anything but D and C rations. And D rations were a little candy bar about that, square and about that thick, and that's what we carried in our pack, a number of those. And that was our, to sustain us for a time. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and I don't remember us getting any hot food or anything while I, until I got back uh, into the hospital there in the tent hospital. But uh, uh, from, from that hospital, if you went back into this one in London, and while we were there, we could hear the bombs once in a while called buzz bombs. They were a type of bomb that the German Jews go over and hit them. They were aiming them at, I believe, at, at London. And we were an awful ways from there, maybe 50, 60 miles. We could hear the wah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed there, and while I was there, uh, my uh, platoon captain came to the same place. And he was injured about the same as I was in mm -hmm. his arm, but he was shot by a sniper. And, uh, and then I, you know, I was there. I also, uh, the fellow that was in the next trench to me, he was in the same place, and he was laying on his stomach, and I saw him, and his back was all raw from the burns and the phosphorus. Did. He didn't have any water, but uh, mine, the water would, um, that would be what would put it out, you know, it didn't, it would burn right into your flesh. And uh, so that's uh, what helped me was that I had a handkerchief and a little water. And then when we were walking, we came across some anti-aircraft gun. Uh, like I said, they gave me some water to put on my handkerchief to help me. Uh, mm. And uh, then I, from there, I, uh, I was there until the end of July in this hospital. In, the day in before, England, you mean? Yeah. yeah. The day before I came home, they took this traction out of my elbow so I could fly on an airplane. And I flew back on a hospital airplane. And my, I went to see my platoon captain before I left. And he was coming back, but he was coming back by boat. And I know I said, I didn't know I was ever going to home because I was so seasick on the way over. I never ate from the time we left. And, uh, so anyway, uh, he. Uh, he came back, uh, but he came by boat. I never saw him again. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not long with this outfit when I first went over, and I went over as a replacement, regiment, amateur replacement training. I took it, that's what I was a replacement. And uh, I joined the 28th Division. Well, shortly after we got there with the 28th Division, for some reason, they moved the whole division out and they brought in the 2nd Division. And when they did, they said, told them, in the 20th Division, they had to leave behind the last recruits they uh, had come to their company. So I was left behind. That's how I got with the 2nd Division. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. In that, you said that the Germans were dropping buzz bombs? Is that what you They were them? shooting them. Shooting them? And they were, uh, it's something like an artillery shell, I think that's what they were. I really don't know for sure what they were. But you could hear them, they made a the noise that. So they started calling the buzz bombs? That's what we call them. Uh -huh. And uh, you said that they were shooting them. Was D Day your first battle? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So was, I just had to make that sure. That mm -hmm. was my. Only Ash was uh, from then until the 13th. Uh-huh. The 7th or the 13th, right? 7th to 13th, yeah. yeah. Um, what was your reaction to seeing the first casualties of war? Was 
heart. The first ones I saw were uh, were Germans. They had got those up yet, and that's Americans. And they used um, the Germans used horses to draw some of their artillery equipment around with. And I remember seeing I think six horses laying in a field right by the road dead that had been strafed. Well, one of the things I remember was that we had air superiority by far. You know, they couldn't do much with it and air. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the, the loss of P-38s would come go ahead of us and they would strafe and bomb. And they I, would what? Strafe and bomb, strafe the field. What, what does that mean? Strafe means taking machine guns and fire to anybody they saw and or army that they saw. And the bombs were... Uh, we'll go the other way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they'd, uh, we, uh, they had air superiority. We didn't have to worry much about being strafed or anything when I, at the time I was here. Mm -hmm. I think maybe later, you know, at the Battle of the Bulge, they might have, by that time I was back in the States. And, mm -hmm. um, Can Okay, when were you honorably discharged from service? August 3, 1945. And uh, what was life like when you returned to the States? Well, I, we got married while I was in the hospital. I was in the hospital in Utica for, uh, here in Utica, I was in Rhodes Hospital for um, we were engaged to be married before I went overseas. I told you. And so we, when I came back, I came back at the end of July. And uh, so then we decided to get married. And this 9th of September, we got married uh, at her parents' house. And I had a cast on when I got, when I got married. And you'll see it, you can see it on my arm. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Cast on, and that's when we got married. Was then. And, you know, oh. I. Um, come back to the States and people were so good to us. I, I, I could hitchhike from Utica to Phoenix where I live. Very easily I could get a ride. I could beat the train, any other transportation I could find other than my own car there. People, everybody would pick me up. They were treating us so great. And uh, I remember when we landed in New York, you know, we came back from overseas. We landed in Newfoundland, had breakfast there and then uh, didn't get off the plane. Then, then we came down to New York, and uh, we got off the plane. I remember there was a band there, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember it was just a, a, a tremendous, tremendous exhilaration of joy to be back home. And, mm -hmm. and the people, all the people treated me great. And, uh, and that was uh, it was a different story um, with the war in Vietnam. It's yeah. a shame. I, I volunteered at the Veterans Hospital had for uh, well, for a number of years. Two, I was doing it two days a week. I worked with the chaplains program there, and you call them veterans. And uh, I've had a, you know a number of those fellows that when they came back, they were spit on, and all things. And a number of those. Fellows are up on the eighth floor of the psychiatric, and I can understand why. Just by the way they were treated when they came home, as though they were criminals, and they were doing the same thing we were doing. Describe how the war changed your life. Well, I had planned when I was at Morrisville, I wanted to go to Michigan State and go on. Uh, further education, perhaps be a veterinarian or something, but it changed my life because I, I couldn't do that anyway anymore because I had a, a 
plate in my arm, and uh, so I wouldn't be able to do that kind of thing. So, uh, and I think that would be the major advantages in my life, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, her, she was an only child, so her father had a farm, and so I went to work for him. For him at first on the farm, and we joined partnerships, and then. Okay. Then I ran the farm until 1964. Then I uh, felt called and went to pastoral ministry and studied and went into that and was a pastor for 27 years. I didn't know that. Oh. Okay. So, uh, um. Have you remained in contact with anyone you served with, or? No, because I never was, well, I did it first with one buddy I had in basic training. I went to see him one time, but he was the only one that I ever really got in contact. The others, I was never with them, only uh, in combat, just about a month and a half with them. And here in basic training, I never really got to know them. There were, most of them were from Texas. Texas National Guard, the second division was. Mm -hmm. So it'd be hard to keep in contact with someone yeah. from Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think about the war in Iraq today? Well, it's a total different war of combat than what we ran. You you know about where your enemy war was in World War Two. They don't know who is their enemy around. It's like something like Vietnam, I think. They can be your friend the daytime and the night they can be out to kill you. Guerrilla warfare? Yeah, guerrilla yeah. type of warfare. I, I think it's, uh, I think that America has been the one that's kind of helped every other country in the world to try to help them to have freedom and peace. And, uh, and we give more material things to other countries than any other country does. Mm -hmm. And I think we were, we are, our attempt is to set them free. Uh, I hope it's not to get them to be just like America, but like their freedom that they would want. So, and, so you agree with it? Yeah, I agree with it. That I, I think it was a thing. I, I would much rather have to fight the terrorists, terrorists over there, than fight them here that's in our true. country. Okay, and true. I think that would be the only alternative would be to let them come here and do like they already did once, and um, and fight them here. And I, I think it's better to, for me. I think it's, it's it makes more sense to go there. Mm -hmm. And I do understand. Okay, Mr. Turk is going to talk about his medals that he got from the war. Okay, uh, the first medal I got was a Purple Heart. That was given to me when I was in a hospital in England, but this is not the one that I got. Uh, you can get all your medals replaced one time, and uh, so I did that again. But I, this one, I, and I, my grandson, one of my, my oldest grandson, he calls me every um, Veterans Day, he calls me, he always has called me that, and uh, so I gave him the original one to have to keep because mm -hmm. I didn't want it to get, this. and so uh, this is what this one is, a Purple Heart, and that's the only one. The rest, all the rest of the medals, well these are what, um, what you earn and when you're taking your basic training, they're uh, marksmanship. Uh, and this one here was given to me in, in, uh, um, in a hospital. This is a combat infantryman's badge, mm -hmm. and uh, you, had, you had to be in combat in order to get that one. Um, the rest of these I, were never presented to me. I just this paper so I wrote to them uh, and asked them. I sent them my discharge, and they said that, and they sent me all these medals that I was entitled to. And this here is a bronze star. And this one here is the American Campaign 
and this one here is uh, uh, I'll have to look at it. I can't remember just what they are now. Uh, oh, good conduct, model. And uh, that one I had to write the second time because I was never with an outfit very long. I go a couple of months because uh, when I took my basic training, that was the longest I was with a group of men. And so I never was, And um, but they sent that one to me. This one here is uh, uh, European Middle uh, Atlantic medal with a, a battle star. There's a star on it, one battle star for Normandy. This one here is uh, World War II, battle at all World War II. Veterans are entitled to. Uh, let's see. This one here is uh, the New York State um, uh, Conspicuous Service Medal. And that I got uh, about uh, uh, three years ago. Uh, my, uh, our assemblyman said, you know, you're entitled to that. Uh, medal, and he, he was going to send where so he did, and it came in the mail. That's the way I got it. Yeah. And that's the way with these medals here, all came in the mail. I, you know, they were never presented except the Purple Heart and the uh, Combat Infantryman's Badge. And what about, yeah. And this is the uh, emblem that you see on my sleeve there. Yeah. Only it's different color. This one that's on there. Ours we had was a white field with a, a more color on the Indian. But uh, you don't wear them in combat because they try too much gunfire. You can see them too far. Oh, really? Huh. So that you don't wear that anything bright, everything. Everything green. Kind of okay. yeah. yeah. And uh, what about those two? Which two? Yeah. Uh, these are our, our medals of uh, you get for a marksmanship. Huh. Our, these are this one's rifle, carabine. Uh, these are actually the two the same BAR. That's a running automatic. That's a semi-automatic rifle. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, what I carried mostly in, in combat. Mortar, bayonet. Hmm. I thought you were nervous for him. Yes, right. Yes. <laughs> okay. I think uh, our country treated us real well, and I've been treated well by our, our government since I, I uh, was discharged, got a medical discharge, and 50% disability. And they treated me well. I'm really proud to be an American. Mm -hmm. And somebody uh, um, asked me how I felt here when the war first started, you know, and different ones would say, how do you feel? I said, I feel great. If I was young enough, I'd enlist again. Mm -hmm.